post and they gave me 49. Gave me 49, boys, gave me 49. Hitched me to the weapon post and they gave me 49. Trouble, trouble, trouble all my mind. If trouble don't kill me, I'll live a long time. Live a long time, boys, live a long time. If trouble don't Hey everybody, I had um, a couple good questions come in. One of them here is a real whopper, so uh, let's jump right in and do our next Q&A. So our friend Rob wrote in, and Rob has sort of a multi-part question about two-finger picking, and here it goes. Concerning the position of the picking hand for two-finger style playing, is it just a matter of preference and comfort or is there a reason players adopt widely different hand locations for different songs or parts of songs? I have seen players picking whole songs up over the neck, like up here, I guess, and others resting their hand on the strings behind the bridge. Okay. Secondly, how do you actually pick the strings in two-finger style? Different players seem to adopt different techniques some appear to use an almost vertical action with the fingertips or picks, while others have a more rolling motion with the ball of their finger um, along the strings. I see. Does this vary with different string materials? Okay, Rob, well, let's see if I can pick that apart. Um, so, I mean, it's both. There is, um, it is a matter of preference and comfort. And it is also, uh, you know, there's more reasons to it than that, too. I mean, it sounds different depending on where you pick. And different players can probably do different things um, depending on where and how they're holding their fingers. Me, I've discussed this with you guys before in my other two-finger picking video. Maybe I'll put a link to that here. Um, uh, I think it's best to have the, the more vertical approach that you're talking about where your fingers are coming down. I think if possible, for me, I try to get the most closest to 90 degree picking to the strings as I can, as opposed to playing more like this, where your fingers are kind of going across the strings. I try to be facing into it. And um, I see what you mean, people putting their fingers, the palm of their hand on the on the back here behind the bridge maybe. That might be something you've seen maybe uh, classical pickers do. I don't know. That would be considered a pretty bad habit among, among bluegrass pickers, I think. Um, but anyhow, my other piece of advice in order to, to achieve that more direct 90 degree picking angle with your finger rather than picking like this, picking up like this, um, I try to arch my wrist a little bit. So I don't, when I'm finger picking, I don't approach the banjo with a flat wrist like this, I'll arch it. You see how that allows me to get the angle of my fingers more perpendicular to the banjo head? I think that that helps me a lot with just accuracy, power, and stuff like that. Um, I will say briefly that, you know, a lot of what I think um, people are missing uh, with, when it comes to their traditional banjo technique is you want to play into the banjo head. It's not like, uh, like you're not, you don't want to, I don't think you should play across the strings so much as play into the strings. So when you're playing overhand or claw hammer, you know, you sort of keep your wrist more straight and you play into the strings to where every time your finger strikes a string, it, it, it should be sliding off I like to slide off and also thump the banjo head every time I strike a string in overhand. And so I kind of have the same idea with two finger picking. I'm playing, picking directly into the banjo head and I'm not really, the balls of my fingers aren't really going across the strings, they're directly into it. It's kind of tricky, hard to explain, but hope that answered your question, Rob. Um, Secondly, yeah, how do you actually pick the strings? I talked about that. Oh, and the third part of your question, you say, does this vary with different string materials? I would say it certainly does. Um, I know I'm going to do have a different attack 
for steel strings as I'm than I would uh, nylon or gut strings, for example. You know, um, you reason you see people all up and down here. I mean, that's just basically different sounds. You know. Um, see it's a lot softer and more gentle sounding up here. Also when you're way up here the strings have way more give in them and that can either be a good thing or a bad thing. When I was younger and I first started two finger picking I always picked way up here by the by the rim and over the years I've kind of gone back. There was a brief time where I used two finger picks and when I had those I like to come way back here sort of like more like a bluegrass picker and really get more lightning fast speed but in recent years, my hand, my picking hand, when I'm doing two finger picking, has migrated back to about the center of the head. And I will always plant these, these three fingers down on the banjo head, about in the center somewhere. And that leaves these two pinchers free to pick. But it's really, basically, Rob, it's up to you. And I think the reason that you see so many different pickers adopting so many different uh, techniques and stuff from all the way up here to way, to way down here behind the bridge, personal preference, you know. Uh, the beautiful thing about the traditional banjo, especially the traditional banjo in our space here, where, you know, me and you guys are hanging out, we, as much as possible, want to throw all those rules out the window and just do whatever's comfortable for you. Uh, try not to focus so much on maybe a lot of things we've heard in the past from teachers and stuff and experts uh, about bad, forming bad habits. I don't worry about that as much. I mean, if something is a bad habit, you're going to notice over time it's going to hang you up, make your hands sore or something like that, and you just stop doing it and you'll work around it. Um, if something is odd but it works for you and over the years you keep doing it and keep doing it and it doesn't hang you up, doesn't make your hands sore, etc., then is it really a bad habit? I would say no. So go ahead and do it. You know, do whatever, do whatever you want to do, Rob, okay, within reason. Okay, let's move on to another question here. Um, Jeremy says, uh, I was wondering, you mentioned that Frank Prophet played without using chords. Could you elaborate what that means? I suppose you mean he played melodies for songs and did not play chords. Well, Jeremy, um, basically all I mean is, um, you know, think, so Frank was primarily, he played on a fretless banjo. And, uh, you know, like, like this one here, similar to something like this with no frets on it. And when you're playing on a fretless banjo, um, you probably know, and I'll tell you again, it's hard to, to make a full chord shape and to make all those, to get it all in the right spot and make it all sound good. You can do it, but a lot of um, folk, you know, vernacular banjo players who just grew up playing a fretless banjo and stuff, they didn't make so many chords. And we've talked about this in other videos too. Um, what they did was they retuned the banjo. To get those different, to get into a different chord, and then you're in an open chord, right? And then you're really just using one finger, occasionally two, and very rarely three fingers up here. Usually, just one finger does all the work. So if you listen to a vernacular, a fretless player like Frank Prophet, and I, I may be mistaken, but I think John Snipes, the great black banjo player from North Carolina, I want to say. I believe he played a fretless banjo on his recordings. And listen to both of those guys, expert banjo players. I think we all agree. But you won't hear too many chords, I don't think. I think they made most of their music with just one finger up here and occasionally two. And that's really how I do. Most of my music is just one or two fingers. And I retune the banjo very often. If you ever see me on a stage, I will usually play two, two or three songs in one tuning. And then I'm twisting these up. I'm going somewhere else because I want to get a different flavor to the sound. So that's what I mean, Jeremy. Frank wasn't making like, you know, these crazy chords and stuff, right? Like, um, uh, you know, like other more, more uh, technical um, guitar style banjo players or whatever, or bluegrass players, right? They might just use two or three tunings tops, but a lot of chord shapes up and down the neck. Well, Frank Prophet didn't do very much of that. So that's what I mean by that. Um, we had another question come in from Katarina in Berlin. Now, Katarina, I'm sorry I don't have your question pulled up here. I had it earlier, but I lost it. But you, you, you said, Katarina, that you just got an 1890s Luscombe banjo. Sort of, that's what this one is right here. And you're saying that the action is, is a little bit too high for you. I had the same problem with this banjo. 
And yes, you're right to suspect that the neck has probably risen up over the years. Um, and you ask if there's anything that you can do quickly to try to, to fix that. And you mentioned um, these screws in here, if, you can, if that's for adjusting the neck. Well, sadly, uh, Katerina, it is not. That's really just to sort of lock to make this tight. It doesn't adjust the angle of the neck. Like on a modern banjo, there'd be machinery and, and truss rods in here to adjust the neck. On these old 1890s Luscombs, that's not the case. Uh, that's just to make it tight. So the only thing that you can really do at home to lower the action is um, try getting a shorter bridge. You can do that. Another way you can make your bridge shorter is you can loosen up your tension hooks. So if your head is really tight, you can loosen it up a little bit. That'll make your bridge go down. Um, but if you don't want to loosen all these, um, all these hooks, then I would suggest getting a shorter bridge. And your banjo probably does need a neck reset. Most of these old antique banjos need a they need a neck reset, and that's going to involve a luthier. Get one of those good German luthiers over there to do it for you. And uh, yeah, that's what you're probably going to have to do. But in the meantime, you can you can get a, just get a shorter bridge and see that might that might solve all your problems for all I know. So okay, everybody, that's about all the time I have for this Q and A. Thanks to everybody who sends in questions all the time. I've got a lot more questions, but I only do these little short things to you know, try to keep it condensed. Um, so thanks for all your questions, all your contributions, and I really appreciate it. I really like doing these Q&As. So keep sending in questions, and uh, check us out on the Patreon group if you haven't already. That's where most of the action is taking place. All right, guys. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you later.